like I think I'm using. Oh. Is Nightbot behaving? There we go. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, again, apologies. Uh, had a guest lined up. Would have been super cool. I actually didn't mention it because I was because we weren't sure it was going to come together. But it's another YouTuber that you're probably many of you are familiar with. What the math, um, Anton? But uh, he's uh, traveling and it's was a little rough. So um, I'm going to put him into the calendar, and we will have a, take another crack at it. Yeah, you just asked me questions, Aiden. That's it. I'm just here answering questions. Um, you the keys to the car? Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Second time I've been stood up. Yeah. I, not really stood up. We didn't really put a firm commitment to the time and date. And the next two months, month and a half is going to be pretty rough for me. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, just to give you a bit of an update, uh, we've got the Astronomy Cast 500, which is happening on the 13th, well, the 14th and the 15th of September. And I'm going to be flying out there and I'm going to be in Illinois and traveling right after that. So that's going to be a little rough that week. And then we've got um, the cruise that I'm doing with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Matt Sutter um, and dozens of our close friends. Um, Chad is coming. My children are coming. And we're going to be doing, oh, there you go, 15th and 16th. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, and we're going to be cruising around the Caribbean. Uh, we're going to be going to the Kennedy Space Center. We've actually got a week to kill in Florida or five days to kill in Florida in between. So we're going to uh, probably try and shoot some stuff on site at the Kennedy Space Center. And so hopefully we're going to be able to get a little bit more uh, footage and maybe do some interviews and stuff. So I'm going to try and make that week, but I'll be pretty, I mean, whenever I travel, internet is the problem. So I have no idea what kinds of live events we'll be able to do. So it could very well be that you won't hear from me for three weeks or uh, we'll we'll be able to do stuff, but it's all going to be running on, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult. Um, so, all right, let's uh, move on to uh, some of your questions. Another quick update for those of you who missed it. We did a really cool star party last week um, with Skylis over on Twitch. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we spent about three hours with uh, Dustin Gibson from uh, Oceanside Photo and Telescope. We went after, I think we got a total of 36 images. Um, uh, took live requests and then I did it again last night. So, um, and this is all over on Twitch, which is sort of the place where I'm experimenting because, and I will bring, uh, these live streams over to YouTube, but I just want to be really careful about it before I do that here, because the algorithm can be pretty, uh, difficult. And if you don't, you can actually like tank your whole channel if you don't have a something that has a really good retention. So I just want to make sure that we create something that people are going to really enjoy. And um, uh, yeah, sun, summertime. I am out all the time when I can over the summer because then all winter long, it just rains and it rains and it rains. Uh, so I sort of have like sort of more of a reddish color and then a more tanned reddish color depending on the time of the year. So... That's how you know which one it is. Um, but I thought I would just show you quickly uh, some cool stuff that we had last night. Um, last night, I uh, did another three-hour live stream with this live telescope. And uh, people challenged me to see if we could find this comet that was going 21P that was in the sky. And uh, we were able to pull it off. So I just want to show you a quick picture of it, which is really cool. Um, and I was just quiet. I'll show you a couple of things here before we move on. So here is, here's kind of what it looks like. So there's me. Um, and unfortunately, I had the telescope turned off there. But this is a comet. And we were able to find it. It was sort of tough to track down. Then I did a, a long exposure on it. Uh, and that was really fun. And I did an even longer exposure on it, like a five-minute exposure on it. And it looked really good. I was quite pleased with it. 
Um, and then finally, we had a little time at the end, and so I went after Andromeda, which looked just, there's the telescope down on the bottom right-hand corner, and there was Andromeda, which just looked great last night. We did a longer five-minute exposure on Andromeda. So if you want to come and hang out with me and, um, and play with the telescope, uh, go over to Twitch, and that's where we're doing that. Um, all right, well, let's get on with some of your questions. Special hi to John Michael Godier. Um, you need to come back, and I guess it's time to do another interview with you. Maybe we'll do that in a couple of weeks. Um, so what hardware? The telescope that we're using is a um, Teleview 127mm apochromatic refractor with a ZWI color camera. And probably the fanciest part about the whole system is actually the mount. All right, Sakura's Light asks, when do you think the star Betelgeuse will go supernova and what will happen? So Betelgeuse is one of the supergiant stars that are relatively nearby that has reached the end of its life and it's going to explode as a supernova. It's entirely possible that it's already exploded and we just haven't seen it because it's a few hundred light years away. And so it could detonate and then it would take a few hundred years for the light of the explosion to reach us. It's very close. And so if it does go off, it'll be very bright, um, easily visible as the brightest star in the sky at nighttime probably visible in the daytime as a star which if you've ever like you've probably seen this before like you can see venus earlier than this you know before it's gone completely dark you can actually see venus in the sky if you know exactly where to look and it's and it's very bright and so you would see probably like if it was really bright you would just it would be obvious even though it was daytime if it wasn't quite that bright you would sort of have to know where to look and to see it and then, of course, astronomers would just have an absolute field day because this would be the closest supernova that's ever been observed in with modern astronomy. The last really close supernova that we've seen is supernova 1987A, which was in the large Magellanic Cloud. So it's like a whole galaxy away. And so we have not in recent memory had a really powerful supernova go off nearby. And so that's what we really want is a, a supernova to, to go off. Now, Betelgeuse is probably not the supernova that's most likely to go off. Um, you know, the one that is almost certainly going to go off first is Eta Carina, which is uh, only visible in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's actually done some really unusual things in the last few decades. It uh, blasted off a lot of its outer layers. And it's incredibly massive, more massive than Betelgeuse. And so the more massive these stars are, the sooner they're going to detonate as, as supernova. And so it really looks like Eta Carina is going to be the, the next one to, to go off. And it is like overdue. It could go any day now. But that could mean tomorrow or that could mean in 100,000 years from now. So um, here's hoping it's tomorrow i want to see this now someone asked um our joan asked is there a star closer to us that could pose a danger so so for regular supernova they really have to be within a few dozen kilometers dozen kilometers dozen light years of the earth for them to to go off and actually uh, cause us any damage and according to astronomers there aren't any candidate supernova stars that could go off within that range now it could be in the ancient past there were stars that were closer maybe even ones that we formed from the same solar nebula and it could be in the future as we drift around in the milky way that these other stars will will get closer to us but right now there are no supergiant stars within that radius of us the other kind of stars that are a risk are the ones the really the hypergiant stars that can turn into um uh, gamma ray bursts and the trick with a gamma ray burst is when one of these stars goes off you get these jets that come out of the poles of the star the magnetic field gets really powerful wraps around the star and all of this energy is blasted out into uh, out of these jets that come out of the top and the bottom of the star and so if one of these jets is directed at the earth you could even still be um, hundreds of thousands, well, anyway, uh, dozens of thousands, so say 50 to 100,000 light years away, 
right? So halfway across, all the way across the Milky Way and still receive a really powerful impact. And fortunately, all of the gamma ray bursts that have ever been discovered have been in other galaxies really far away. But if a gamma ray burst went off within the Milky Way and it happened to be pointed at the Earth, it could strip off the ozone layer of the Earth. And you know, if it did that, then we would all get like deadly sunburn. So it would cause a, a pretty catastrophic impact on planet Earth until the ozone layer was able to recover. So uh, again, astronomers don't know of any stars that are lined up in that way in, in any, you know, anywhere nearby. So it doesn't seem like there are any, but it's still possible that there could be one that we don't know of and it could go off and, and hit the earth. But the chances are super low. When you think about how long people have been uh, here on earth, how long life has been on earth. But this is one of the explanations that some scientists have for, for how life on earth gets destroyed. So there you go. Um, great question. How, how are my lungs? Oh, okay, so Larry Beckham is asking about our fires. Um, the fires have been terrible, just terrible, like worse, like last week, I think I complained about the fires and they just got worse. The visibility on Vancouver Island dropped to about a kilometer. Like it's amazing. I've never seen it so bad. Never. Um, the sun, you could almost look at the sun in the day, in the middle of the day. And it was just this pale orange circle in the sky. Um, but, uh, and things cleared up. Uh, there's still a little bit of smoke in the sky, but, but, um, people, uh, but things cleared up within the last uh, couple of days and now it's a lot clearer. There's still a little bit of smoke, but it's so much better, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the fires are any better. We had one rainfall, but still it's very dry. So I really hope that this clears up and I hope we have, uh, we're at a level four drought here on Vancouver Island, which is like the, the worst kind of drought you can have. In, and so we have one of the worst droughts in all of British Columbia right now. But we don't have any water restrictions because we actually have a really good snowfall. So it's just, it's very dry, but we still have water. So um, let's move on. Uh, uh, S. Sowley is saying, would you comment on the talk of the 2018 Mars Society Convention by Paul Wooster? I haven't seen that. Um, could you email me a link to that? Uh, so that I remember, I would love to talk about it. So just email that to Fraser Kane at, at Gmail and I will take a look at it. Um, Oil City is asking reflector or refractor telescopes. Are you wanting to know whether people should get a reflector or refractor? It's like, it's like saying pickup truck or sports car. Um, Liam Manning, what planet do you think that we should send a probe to other than Mars? Uh, that's a great question. And I think Mars, I mean, I would love to see more probes sent to Mars, but I think the biggest gap in our planetary knowledge right now is Venus. Absolutely. Uh, Venus is one of the least, uh, studied worlds in the entire solar system, which is really surprising when you consider the fact that it is the same, um, mass roughly as earth and has about the same gravity as earth and so you have this planet that was like earth in the past and yet it went horribly horribly wrong uh where its uh, geologic cycle uh stopped its plate tectonics ceased uh, carbon dioxide built up in the atmosphere to the point that it's like 93 times the atmospheric uh, mass uh, pressure of of the earth um, and yet it is this planet that is like Earth's twin. It's another Earth. It's right there, right beside us. And the most careful research that's been done on it, there was the Magellan spacecraft that went back in the 1980s and did really rudimentary scanning of the Venusian surface. There have been a couple of probes that have landed down there thanks to the hardworking Soviets uh, and their problems with lens caps, if people remember that. And then there's been the uh, European Space Agency's uh, Venus Express that just died just a, a couple of years ago. But really, there hasn't been any thorough study. And a lot of planetary scientists are pretty sad about that fact. So I think if I w was to choose one place to go next, it would definitely be Venus. There's a mission on its way to Mercury, Bepi Colombo. There's the, the Parker Solar Probe that's going to the sun. 
as you said, Mars is crawling with spacecraft. Juno and Europa Clipper uh, are going to be at Jupiter. Saturn would be nice to return to, but Cassini did such a fantastic job of studying Saturn that I think planetary scientists are going to be chewing on that for a while. Uh, Uranus and Neptune, we should definitely go back to them, and they are gigantic mysteries right now. And I'm actually worried. You know, I put into the community people to vote for what the next um, uh, topic should be, and you overwhelmingly wanted to know about a return to Pluto. So I'm working on that right now. Um, which is going to come out after the Dark Matter one, which will probably come out in the next couple of days. So, uh, yeah. So if in order, I would like a return to Venus. I would like a mission to Uranus or Neptune, uh, and then possibly a return to Pluto. An orbiter or a lander at Pluto would be my choices. All right, moving on. Um, Grant Lanning, any thoughts about the booties void? Is this just an anomaly or is this caused by the universe expanding? Um, I think we did we not talk about this last week. Um, the the so the and I think this is making a return because some popular YouTube channel did a video about the booties booties void, um, and it is essentially a gigantic uh, cosmic void out there in the universe. There, you know, the universe when it started out was fairly uniform, and then gravity pulled stars together, galaxies together. And as the universe continued to expand, the parts that already had gravity, the already parts that had mass, pulled more and more material into their own region. So you got these gigantic galaxy clusters. And at the largest scales of the universe, you've got these walls and, and um, you know, regions that are, you know, like they almost look like bubbles, but the, but the material of the bubble is galaxy clusters surrounding empty regions and this is just what you would expect as the universe is expanding and yet gravity is pulling these galaxies together you would expect these holes to open up where there's less gravity less density and as the universe continues to grow and grow and grow the these galaxy clusters are eventually going to start to snap at whatever the expansion of the universe is going to overtake the the gravitational attraction of these galaxy clusters and eventually these voids are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so i don't think there's any Anything really um, special about the galaxy clusters? It's or about the about the voids. Um, they are just regions that that are where the density is lower than in places like around nearby, where we've got lots and lots of galaxies. So there will still be stars and there will still be galaxies in these voids, but just less than we've got here. Um. Let's move on. Uh, I've got the volume cranked up. I can over crank the volume, Josh, but I think that's maybe turn up your volume. Am I not using this microphone? Um, let's hit me with another question. Uh, Luke adds it. How soon do you think we'll have asteroid mining start to be a thing? That's a great question. Um, I. I think that asteroid mining is there's kind of two I'm as always I'm sort of of two minds on the one hand I am eternally um optimistic and always surprised at how quickly technologies are advancing and how quickly various uh, groups are demonstrating the various pieces of asteroid mining are coming together and then on the flip side I am um you know you see a lot of setbacks that make you go oh it's going to take a little longer than than we thought right um, the, like, for example, you've got the, um, uh, planetary resources, which was this company that was founded to, to mine asteroids and they developed their own spacecraft, the Arcid series. Uh, they got a lot of investment. Uh, they did a really great crowdfunding project and now it looks like they're struggling financially. They had to sell off a bunch of things and that's because like, I'm sure asteroid mining is just this bottomless pit that you throw money into until maybe at some point down the road, you get to see a return on investment. And, and the problem is, is that, that, that making money from mining asteroids is a long-term financial commitment, right? You need to build the spacecraft. You need to figure out how to even do this. You got to be able to, to send spacecraft to these, to these asteroids. You got to mine them. You got to bring this material back. Should someone be able to figure this out? Um, 
then you'll be able to, uh, you'll make billions, trillions of dollars, but it's all of that investment that's going to be required to get to that. And then on the flip side, you've got all these amazing technologies that are being developed. Um, Made in Space is developing their uh, Arcanaut, which is a 3D printer in space that can build, it just sort of extrudes like a spider, um, builds, uh, you know, various trusses and building elements and rivets and screws and puts them all together. So all the technology is there. What it's going to require is some organization with incredibly deep pockets to be willing to pay and pay and pay and pay and pay and pay, and pay until the technology works out and they're able to start bringing some of these resources back to earth. And of course, once you do that, you don't want to bring the resources back to earth. You want to leave them in space because space um, is, is once you've gotten those resources out in space, you don't want to bring them back into our gravity. Well, you want to leave them out there. So, so I think that, that when someone finally has the deep pockets that will be able to pay for it and until it's solved and then the, they'll bring the resources back and be able to use them in orbit. That's when you're going to see this thing finally take off. Moving on. Um, do you see space tourism? Uh, okay. So Bel Shazar says, do you see space tourism being a big thing once the dragon two Starliner start to fly? So for people who don't know, right, right now, the United States has no way to send American astronauts to the international space station. They have to use Russian based Soyuz spacecraft to get there, which isn't a, necessarily a bad thing. The Soyuz is probably the most dependable, most, used human spaceflight vehicle that's ever been developed, right? Uh, they work and they work and they've been, and they, the, the design has remained unchanged. But of course, the problem is that you're having to hire this from, from Russia, while I think America, the United States would like to have its own way to, to be able to send its um, astronauts up to the International Space Station. So they developed two different kinds of um, human capsules. Uh, one supplied by Boeing called the CST-100 Starliner, um, and then the other one is by SpaceX called the Dragon, uh, the Crewed Dragon, and it's a modification of the Cargo Dragon that's currently flying to the International Space Station. And if all goes well, later this year, we're going to see some, some un- crewed test flights next year we should start seeing some actual crew go up to the international space station um but the uh but and once that happens right but these are still really expensive flights these are going to be costing nasa uh tens of millions hundreds of millions of dollars for a long-term contract to send up their astronauts to the international space station so i don't think they're really going to sort out the space tourism side of things. I think that's going to come from, um, from other researchers, other programs here that are lower cost. And the best example of that, of course, is Blue Origins, uh, Blue Origin, not or Ins. Um, and they're sending up their rocket, their new Shepard, and they're going to probably see some tests with human beings late this year, into next year. And if it's not uh, Blue Origin, you've also got what's happening with Virgin Galactic. I think they're ready to send humans up to the edge of space next year. Both are going to be costing in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, but hopefully over time, we're going to see those costs come down. So I see it as two completely separate things. I don't see t space tourism is really supplying the kind of money that it, it's going to take to, to really create humankind's future in space. Um, I see it as more um, a way for these companies to fill another niche and maybe learn a little bit about spaceflight, but it's, it's a whole separate scale to go orbital velocities and go into space. Um, I know... Raz Siddiqui wants me to talk to an astrobiologist. Yeah, I've got a couple that I've been reaching out to, so stay tuned. I will find someone for that. I would love to. Um, any more questions? Let me go back now. And remember the question mark. Um, John Michael Godier asks, what do you see the human, the human space capsules do you see as the most viable Boeing, SpaceX, NASA? Right. So when we mentioned the, 
the SpaceX Crew Dragon, and we mentioned the Boeing Starliner, but I didn't mention uh, the NASA version, which is the Orion. And the funny thing is, and I haven't really dug into this yet, but a really weird question is, why hasn't NASA considered sending the Orion capsule as a way to carry astronauts to the International Space Station? Because you could take the Orion capsule, you could put it on a smaller launch vehicle, an Atlas Delta, and it could get up to the space station. And so I actually want to talk to someone from NASA and, and pose them that question, uh, because the Orion is going to be the one that's going to take astronauts out beyond low Earth orbit, out beyond the orbit of the moon, and really start helping develop the infrastructure for for the next round of humanity's um, exploration of deep space. And you would think that it would be able to uh, to do that. So that's, uh, that's an, an open question. I think my, um, let's see. So which one is it gonna be, right? SpaceX is has demonstrated that they're trying to bring costs down. They're trying to make things inexpensive, reusable. Um, and while Boeing has tons of experience working with NASA in the past and developing this kind of hardware. So I don't know which one it's going to end up being for the long term. I suspect NASA is just going to use both for a long time. And then if something just obviously happens that one or the other becomes uh, the dominant launch platform and it's ridiculous to use the other one, I think that NASA, if you know, if I were running NASA, I would want to uh, not keep my eggs in one basket. So that's what I would do. Um, and competition's good, as uh, Ghost World said. <laughs> Eric Wong, what was it that I wanted to ask you? I don't know. You have to tell me. Uh, Martian Wolf, do you think that Opportunity Rover will respond to NASA? I believe last week I said I my gut tells me no. Here we are a week later. My gut continues to tell me no. Um, it's been since June, since the, the dust storm rose up on Mars. Uh, the dust storm is mostly cleared now. There's been some just beautiful pictures coming back from some astronomers of the surface of Mars. You can see really detailed features. So a lot of sunlight is making it to Mars now, and the hope is that we would hear from Opportunity. Um, and so far, I haven't heard of anyone hearing from, from Opportunity. So, so keep hoping, but don't count on it. Um, moving on. <laughs> S. Soli saying that SpaceX has the crew catwalk added. So there you go. It's true. That thing looks pretty fantastic. It just looks, if you haven't seen pictures, let me see if I can pull up a picture and, and show you. It looks, uh, it looks awesome. <laughs> like totally of the future. Do I have an image of it somewhere? There it is. All right, let me just show you this picture quickly. Right? Look at that thing. That's cool. I totally, I could totally walk on that on the to the BFR and fly off to space. Um, oops, I lost my chat. All right, moving on. Uh, Belshazzar is saying that I've read somewhere that the Orion can launch another vehicle. It's not sure if it includes the Falcon Heavy. Yeah, so it it, it has already launched on, uh, I forget, an Atlas or a Delta. So it can absolutely launch on any one of those those spacecraft. And to get up just, just to orbit, just being able to reach the... Oh, I've got the saddest dog beside me. Come here, sad dog. Oh. Carla took the car and all the happiness in the world. All right. Moving on. Yeah, the gantry to the mission in the contact movie. Um, let's see. Arjun is asking, what is the process of getting your space project to space, like 3D printing in orbit or Vasimir or in space construction? So I don't understand. Can you, can you explain that more deeply? My space mission? There you go. Oil City saying that we they used a Delta Heavy, so that's perfect. <laughs> Let's see the dog. Oh, I don't want to pull the the uh, camera system off. 
Come here, Chuck. You're gonna have white dog fur all over me. Come here, Chuck. Come here. Come here. There you go. Oh, this is the best, right? This. Do you want to be part of the action? All right. There you go. I'll teach you to whine. Okay. Raza asked, uh, Raza City, if you were to plan one NASA mission, which one would you plan? Oh, man. That's a great question. Um, I mean, it could, uh, I mean, I feel like I'm a broken record, right? Like, I want to know if there's aliens. So the thing that I want to know is I want to, I want to have the most powerful mission capable of, of resolving the atmospheres and searching for biosignatures on other worlds. And whatever is going to be the telescope that's going to do that, that's the one that I want to be a part of. Um, yeah, Bull Terrier, English Bull Terrier. My wife is obsessed with them. Chuck is her name. Chucka, 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 Woo Woo, I believe is her name. The full name. Don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Corey Kearney saying it looks like a Cherry's dog. Yeah, Don Cherry. So in Canada here, we have a famous hockey announcer, and he's known for having these uh, bull terriers. <gasps> All right. <laughs> can the dog answer your questions? Yeah, she sure can, but then she won't stop. So I can get her to talk, but then it's just bark, bark, bark. Um, Mr. Philip Burroughs, Fraser, what are your thoughts on the Van Bra Von Braun space station proposed by the Gateway Foundation? Time scale, if, when, it'll happen. Thanks for your time. Uh, so I haven't looked too much into the Gateway Foundation's plans for building an orbital space station. I've looked at building orbital space stations in general. Um, and I did the math one time, like, you know, the space station that was in 2001. Uh, it would take something like 60, man, I forget how many I said. 10,000 launches of the BFR, like some ridiculous amount of launches, more launches by a factor of 10 than all the cargo that's ever been sent into space to build that kind of a structure. And yet there is this fundamental question, which is, is will being in a rotating space station help us deal with the problems of microgravity and that is still an unsolved question right now so before we build something of grand scope that fulfills our 2001 dreams i would love to see a small prototype rotating centrifuge attached to something uh, be it the international space station be it the deep space gateway be it its own standalone vehicle and, uh, you know, we did an episode about this uh, a couple of months ago, and we just need a, you know, something that's just a few meters across that the astronauts sleep in and it just rotates. And, uh, you know, some of these can even be like if they're they're just like a like two, like a bolo, right? Like just two little pods and the astronauts get in and they rotate up. You can fit these inside like an existing SpaceX uh, fairing. So you don't need a gigantic, gigantic launch system, 10,000 BFRs, uh, building this enormous orbiting space station. We just need to demonstrate that we can deal with microgravity for long periods of time and deal with the health effects. And so we need to walk before we run. And I think that's something that I would like to see happen. Um, Fernanda Backer, Fraser, do you think that our sun will become a planetary nebula? Some astronomers say it's not big enough, but others say it's likely to happen. That is exactly the answer that I would give you. So you did it. Um, uh, for the longest time, astronomers thought that when our sun died, it was going to become a planetary nebula like the ring nebula or the helix or the, um, the dumbbell, any of these planetary nebulas where the star becomes a red giant, puffs out its outer layers, and and then cools down into this little white dwarf. And, and, and you get these beautiful planetary nebula that last for a few thousand years. And up until like last year, two years ago, astronomers were all convinced that that was what was going to happen to the sun. And now they're, they're not entirely sure. Some have said, well, it's not, it doesn't have enough mass to actually turn into a planetary nebula. Um, a few billion years from now, I guess it doesn't really matter. 
Someone will know. Uh, Oxculin says, Breakthrough Star Shout update. Um, I interviewed Avi Loeb here three weeks ago and asked him every single Breakthrough Star Shot question you could possibly hope. So go back through the videos, look for Avi Loeb. It's about three weeks ago, and uh, it was the greatest interview. He was such an amazing guy. Talked about all of my unsolved, all my unknown uh, questions about Breakthrough Star Shot, and so I highly recommend that you check it out. And now the second time with three question marks. One for each week ago that you need to go back to find that interview. Um, Duck and Rooster says, why not build a large cord between two capsules and spin it up to simulate gravity? Uh, yeah, so that's a great example. We've talked, to, talked about this idea of a centrifuge. Another idea is to, is to run a cable and to have two spacecraft that are far enough away where they start, you know, you can have them turn and and you'll have gravity. It'd be like sort of at the end of a bucket, right? That you are holding. Um, th that could work. There's a few problems, right? You've got the sort of the tensile strength of whatever cable is connecting the two spacecraft together. You've got the issue of trying to spin it up in the first place. And then you've got to like, what if the people on one side of the spacecraft want to get to the people on the other side of the spacecraft and this thing is spinning? So it sounds like a great idea if you want to send a spacecraft to a place like Mars. You you have the main spacecraft and then you've got the rotating part that goes around or even just the whole spacecraft. Like imagine the spacecraft is two Orion capsules. They detach a cable in between them and then they spin themselves up. And then for that mission, they go to Mars on this spinning spacecraft. Uh, it's a great idea. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of downsides and you would just want to, again, just test it out. Somebody's got to test something ever. Um, so there you go. Uh, Ghost World, uh, do you have any interest in ham amateur radio? Uh, not really. I think it's the kind of thing that I totally would have gotten into like 20 years ago, but the internet is the best. And it's just like, I don't know, it's the best. So, um, Neil, you ice found on the moon's polar caps. Are we going to get that or what? Very valuable. No. Yeah. So, um, over the last week in the newsletter, I mentioned, um, that they found like absolutely super confirmed that there's water ice in the permanently shadowed craters at the poles of the moon. And this is something that had been theorized for a long time and various spacecraft had detected signals of water coming from around the poles of the moon. And it's definitely um, mixed in with the regolith on the moon, but they've absolutely confirmed what look like thousands of these little permanently shadowed craters where the sunlight has never been able to evaporate away this water ice on the moon. And so future lunar colonists could go and tap into this water and have everything they need for rocket fuel, for breathing, for drinking, for creating uh, atmosphere, for growing plants and other things like that. So um, it's, it's a fantastic discovery. And now just kind of says, well, now what, right? Like everything that you need to survive on the moon is on the moon. The most important one being the water. So, so let's go. Let's go to the moon. Let's go back. Now, I don't necessarily think it's important to set up a colony on the moon, but it sure is the kind of place that needs to be explored. And it would be a lot of fun to send uh, humans to explore it as well. So I would love to see humans go back to the moon. And now we can see that those resources are there. Uh, Astro YYZ link to the newsletter. I think there's a uh, Nightbot command for it, but it's just universe today.com slash newsletter. Todd Larson, have you seen the movie The Beyond? I thought it was very unique and imaginative. No. Where is it? No, I haven't seen that. Cool. I'll check it out. Is it on? It's on Netflix, isn't it? Yeah, I'll watch it. Right on. Carl and I are always looking for new movies to watch. Zitrex, would you recommend a computer science major to work at SpaceX? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, well, I've never worked at SpaceX, so I don't know. Could be a, you know, meat grinder, and you would just be sad working there every day. But uh, but yeah, I think that 
um, you know, if you're fascinated by space flight and you want really want to help humanity reach the stars, uh, you should totally apply for a job there. I mean, the great thing about, I've mentioned this many times in the past, no matter what you like, um, uh, computer science is such a great way because everything is computers now. So if you want to be an astronomer, learn some computer science. If you want to be an engineer, learn some computer science. It's all computer science. It's all computers. Everything is run by computers. And the more computer knowledge you know, it's amazing how much of my own uh, computer science background I have to use with the work that I do. So uh, I always recommend to everybody, no matter what they like, make your backup plan be computer science. And then if you can't get that astronomy, that low paying astronomy job that you really want, that was always your dream, you can always settle and make a few hundred thousand dollars at Google. So it's a great backup plan. Uh, and it's amazing. Like, it's just like, and we're just getting started. Like when you think about things like the, the large synoptic survey telescope, which is going to be dumping terabytes of data onto the internet every day, um, you're going to need to have people who know how to work with really big databases uh, to be able to work work with that kind of data. I was just browsing around the European Southern Observatory's data archive to pull some some files and to play around with some of their images, and they were like, "What were they like? Five gigabyte? One picture? One photograph taken by the European Southern Observatory's um, narrow field imager with like five gigabytes. And so I have to download that and then I have to, it's a FITS file and I have to process the FITS file and, you know, and so there's, so computer science, always. Um, someone asked me if I'd seen Primer. Yes, I love Primer. Well, I don't think that anybody can really say they understand Primer, the movie. It's a time travel movie. Um, I felt, I enjoyed the half that I understood and then I just felt sort of awed and stunned by the rest of it. So I, I believe that's the right response for this. Um, Todd Larson, Fraser, what's the largest live audience during a stream you've ever had? Well, the largest, there's a couple. So the largest live, live audience recently that we've ever had was the, uh, the live stream that Corey and David and I did of the lunar eclipse that was visible from South Africa and half of the world, but not here. Um, and we had at times closing in on 20,000 simultaneous viewers, and we hit about a million total viewers over the course of the entire live stream. So that was, that was impressive. Um, the other really big event that we did was actually back in 2012, we did a live stream of the Curiosity landing. And so we brought in a whole bunch of guests. We had Alan Stern, who's the principal investigator of, um, of, uh, New Horizons. We had, um, oh man, people from the SETI Institute and other space journalists. And we were all talking. We had people at the actual, at NASA JPL. Amy Shear Title was there. It was awesome. We had a really good time. And in fact, NASA after that uh, gave us a kudos for doing our coverage of the live event. We sort of took their coverage and just wrapped it in our own live coverage. And it was a lot of fun. And we had, man, I'm trying to remember how many people that we had. We had thousands and thousands watching us live. So that was really great. Um, I really should do more of these live events. And I can see a lot of my friends now are, are have sort of are dominating. Um, I kind of like to let them do that now. It's great. Uh, Tim Dodd, Everyday Astronaut, does a great job of, of doing live coverage of some of these events. But you may get some, uh, may get some competition again. Who knows? Uh, the insight is coming. Um, you're on notice, Tim. Join me. All right. Let's see. I should totally jump in. Actually, it was funny. Uh, during the last, the Parker Solar Probe launch, Tim did a live event of that. And Cody from Cody's Lab and I were chatting in the comments. It was sort of blowing people's minds. Well, well, we were yakking to him and to each other and to the people that were watching the live event. That was a lot of fun. So there you go. Close to 20,000 people. A million people watched the live stream. That was the biggest one that we did. Oh, see you later, Exoplanets channel. Um, Malaki Norris, how much longer until the Voyager spacecraft batteries die? Wah, wah. Um, they're probably going to go for about another 10 years. So at this point, 
The power levels are very low. They can't turn on very many of the instruments. All they can really do, they can transmit data back and they've got a few instruments they're trying to still sense the environment that's out there in the in the outer solar system and then probably with the next 10 years or so they're going to the power levels are going to drop to the point that they can't run their transmitters they can't run the instruments and they're going to have to shut the spacecraft down and then they will fly through space for a billion years until they get worn down by the intergalactic dust of the universe um <laughs> As for why he said, Tim Dodd does launches. Does he do landings too? He probably does. Yeah. Um, Oil City says, do you ever go down to any launches? I've only seen one. I've, I've attempted two launches and I've seen one in my life. So the first launch that I attempted was in 2011. My father and I went to the space shuttle, the, the penultimate space shuttle launch. And unfortunately, we got down there. We saw the shuttle, got a chance to be journalists. And then um, it was delayed for a month, so I couldn't, I couldn't stick around killing time in Florida for a month, so I had to come back, and so I missed the space shuttle, which was really too bad. I mean, that is one of my great regrets, especially because I've been doing this job for so long. I've had so many opportunities that I could have gone down and seen the space shuttle launch, and I never did it. And then the, when I finally got my act together, I missed it. Um, but the other mission that I got a chance to see was the OSIRIS-REx mission, which launched, man, like two years ago now. And that was great. Um, took Carla and Chad and, uh, and then met up with a bunch of people there. Sandy, Pamela was there. Uh, Morgan Renberg was there. Um, so that we had a great time. And it was fantastic to see a, a rocket take off. It wasn't a beast like the Falcon Heavy, but it still was a pretty impressive thing. I don't think I'm going to go rocket crazy now, you know? I mean, if, if one was taking off nearby, I would go and check it out, but I don't feel that, you know, it's not like bucket list fulfilled, um, but I don't need to now chase the world looking for rocket launches in the way that I know I want to see more total solar eclipses. Like the bits and pieces that we saw of the solar eclipse last year, that just made me want to see more of them. Or auroras, right? Auroras are just, they're magical and amazing every time, and I want to see more of them. So uh, if I happen to see more rocket launches, I will. But uh, it, it was, it, you know, I'm not addicted. They're great. You should go see one. Uh, and the great part, and I've mentioned this before, is that you are, I mean, they're, they're easy to see, right? From Florida, you go to this to Cocoa Beach. You get a ho nice hotel or a crappy hotel on the beach, um, and at the appointed time, you walk down to the beach with a mai tai in hand, and you look out towards Cape Canaveral, and you watch a rocket take off. Very civilized, so you don't have to really, you don't have to fly down to, you know, to the European Space Agency's launch facility in South America, and and you know, go through all that effort. It's a very easy flight to get to, and a really convenient place to watch launches from. So I highly recommend it. Um, let's see. Uh, Grant Landing saying, upcoming Falcon Heavy launch. You should be there to share it with live with all of us. I would love to. Uh, Patreon.com slash universe today. <laughs> it's expensive, right? I mean, this is the reality. And this is why you're seeing launch coverage is not as comprehensive as it once was back in the day, CNN, MSNBC, um, all of these groups had dedicated journalists that work on worked on space and and you know the space industry. And they would go down to these launches and they would cover them. But because of this transition to the modern sort of the internet age of of journalism, these organizations can't afford to send to send journalists anymore. And we internet journalists can't afford to send journalists either, right? To go and fly down from for me from Canada to fly to to Cape, you know Cape Canaveral and to hang out for a couple of days in a hotel and bring the team. It's thousands of dollars, and there's no way to make that kind of money from it. So unfortunately, we have to live off of the live streams. When if when things do line up, then I will try. But apart from that. Um, Tim Smith, have you been offered a chance to do a TED Talk? No, I have not. Was that an offer? Accept. Um, let's see. Crushnut, uh, coolest object to see in lower power telescope binoculars. Uh, there's a bunch. Um, 
the moon is the best, I think. Uh, and then to just look through the Milky Way and look at all of the objects that are going on in the Milky Way are wonderful. I love the uh, the double cluster in Perseus. I really like you could you can make out the globular clusters, um, but they're a little harder to see. They just look like a little tiny fuzzy ball. Um, the Orion Nebula looks pretty cool, uh, but it is definitely um, the best way to get into visual astronomy. So I highly recommend it. Uh, get a pair of binoculars if you have any interest. Um, Friday McGee is working the Estes rocket. I'll let you know it's ready. Perfect. Yeah. And then do, we'll do a live stream of your rocket launch. Actually, this is one of my great sadnesses is I never got into model rocketry. I've seen like one model rocket launch in my life. And I, I keep meaning to, to pick that up as a hobby because it's awesome, right? <laughs> um... Carl Chemical, what's my opportunity eulogy? I don't know. When we know for sure, we'll we'll have to write something to say goodbye to opportunity. I'll probably do a video. When opportunity dies, that will allow me to do a final video about the the Mars exploration rovers and uh, and not feel like I'll I won't have covered the whole story. So I'll do that. How do you do the question thing on Android phone? Doesn't seem to work. I don't know. Um, Sergio Botero, if the Hubble's orbital period around Earth is just over 90 minutes, how is it possible to take these ultra deep pictures that are needed for long exposures? Um, yeah, great, great question. So like the Hubble ultra deep field, I believe it was something like 20 plus days of data taken in this one tiny field of view. And they just kept taking pictures and pictures and pictures and building up all of this data over time to the point that they were able to see all those tiny little galaxies to resolve those photons from the background noise. And the way they do it is that Hubble, you know, they have booked the Hubble, the time on Hubble, and it will point at some object take data and then maybe it's on the other side of the earth it will point at different objects and they've got a very detailed plan for how they use hubble and then when it comes back around it'll point back at that exact same spot and continue watching and they build up those pictures over time so often when you hear about those things it's it's the entire time as a great example we were doing the live stream of um the telescope live stream and dustin Gibson, who's the owner of Oceanside Photo and Telescope, he was saying that he um, he's doing a 90 hour image of um, of some object. I forget exactly which one it was. And the way he's doing that is over the course of the night, he's just setting his telescope to take as many pictures as it can as much of the night as he can. And then the next night he's taking more pictures of it and then more pictures of it. And then he's going to stack up all of those images to remove the noise. And anyone who's ever done any astrophotography, you can, uh, you can do that. You know, you take a hundred pictures of the Milky Way, and then you can take all those pictures, stack them up in a piece of software, and it will then be able to know what parts of the picture is noise and what is data. And it'll be able to throw out the noise and make a much clearer picture that has a much better look to it. And so the more time you spend pointing your telescopes at objects, the better they look. And that's why these virtual star parties that we've been doing are so much fun because they're quick and dirty, right? I'm just like, let's see a picture right away. Five minutes, three minutes, one minute, uh, 30 seconds, not 90 hours. And how good a picture can we make in as short a period of time as possible? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. How can I make it be a show as opposed to someone sitting down for a week straight trying to build one picture? I don't think people would have the patience to watch that. Uh, match rocket. When will we have fusion rocket engines? Um, I, think about the chain of technology that's going to be required to be able to do that. We're going to need uh, fusion power. <laughs> then we're going to need to be able to miniaturize it. And then we're going to be able to turn it into a rocket. So um, we're going to see first fusion from ITER in seven years, I think. And then... Uh, which is that big fusion experiment that's happening in Europe. And then if that works, then we're going to see other kinds of fusion happen after that. And then, oh, is it still the saddest dog? Chuck, come here. Chuck. No? Okay. Um, 
uh, yeah, and so we're going to see another mission, you know, we're going to see the, the first fusion in seven years. We're going to see other versions of flavors of fusion happen. We're probably still 20, 30 years away from that happening. Then they've got to be able to miniaturize it for something that could actually go onto a spacecraft. Then they've got to be able to launch it in space and test it out. 50 years until we see a fusion engine? Sorry. Steve Hunt, are you sad about all the great future discoveries that you won't see in your lifetime? I, I used to be, uh, but now I'm kind of not um, because there will always be a time when you're, it's like buying a computer, right? Are you sad about the computer that you just bought because now you won't be able to buy the next, the more powerful computer is going to show up in a couple of weeks. So think about what just happened, right? The Parker Solar Probe just launched. We're going to watch a, a spacecraft go closer to the sun than has ever happened before. Um, the InSight mission is on its way to Mars. It's going to land and search for earthquakes on the surface of Mars. We had Cassini. We're about to have another mission to go back to Mercury, Bepi Colombo. We're going to see humans uh, launch on American spacecraft shortly. Uh, and if the SpaceX's plans next year, we're going to see the BFR, things like that. So I'm suitably excited and so all the time about all the things that are happening that I don't really... I'm, I'm not that sort of worried about what the future looks like uh, now. I'm so um, entertained by all of the advances that are happening all of the time. And as opposed to sort of putting all my eggs in this one, like when are we going to launch? You know, uh, there haven't been humans on the moon in almost 50 years and now I'm sad, right? And that I believe is sort of the default state by most people who are into space exploration but the reality is there's so many amazing things that are happening all of the time in every corner look at the revolution in the small launch market cubesats um uh, it just goes on and on and on and on i could do a whole episode for an hour straight where i'm just excited about all of the amazing things that are happening in space flight and and so i'm not that concerned about what the future holds because right now is keeping me entertained enough um, <laughs> welcome, Ben. Um, Jordan, if our universe can be randomly be created from nothing, do you think that it makes sense for multiple or infinite universes? I mean, that is like a philosophical question, right? Uh, why is there something and not nothing? And instead of me answering that question, I highly recommend you check out Sean Carroll's new podcast called Mindscape. And he covers that exact question and has does a whole episode. And this is someone who, you know, is a renowned theoretical physicist who thinks about this problem all the time and spends an hour deeply probing the question of what does that question even mean? What would it mean to have other universes, multiverses? How could we get at a scientific answer to that question? So so this is me promoting Sean Carroll's podcast, uh, Mindscape. Check that out. You'll really enjoy it. Um, Justin Steger says, I hope the coverage of what CubeSats are doing gets better. I think they'll only get more powerful and provide more public-friendly data. Yeah, I totally agree. There, There is a revolution happening in the small satellite, small launch marketplace, and it is not being covered as well as the big NASA missions and what SpaceX is doing and things like that. And... There are some people like I think Ars Tech, you know, Eric Berger from Ars Tech is doing a terrific job. America Space does a great job of this. Um, NASA Spaceflight does a really good job of this. But there are so many fascinating companies that are launching really interesting experiments and missions on really unique launchers. And I would love to be able to cover more of this here. And I think I will. So thank you for reminding me. Um, and Sean Carroll actually is, has agreed to come and chat with me sometime. So, so we'll make that happen. Uh, nice going twirl up the mist. You did it. You found the question mark emoji. All right. Well, I think we reached the end of our hour. So thanks everyone for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we go, uh, again, follow me on Twitch. There could be some more telescope live streamery happening, uh, over the next few days. Uh, still trying to figure this out. <laughs> trying to make the technology, trying to make focus work, but I would love to hang out and it's a much longer stream and less people show up. So if you want to pick my brain, that's a good way to do it. Um, again, uh, patreon.com slash universe today. If you want to support the work that we're doing, if you want to pay Chad so he can eat, 
Um, uh, that's how it happens. Um, but uh, again, thanks to the moderators, thanks to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Go to wshcrew.space. All of our other shows are coming back very soon, just a couple of weeks. Nancy, I think, has the schedule for when things are coming up. Um, and apart from that, uh, Dark Matter episode dropping in just a couple of days, but it's a monster, so it kind of took us a little longer than we were expecting. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. I will see you all next week.